Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston, and I want to talk to you about problem A2 on this year's 2024 Putnam competition. So this problem is about polynomials. It asks, for which polynomials P does there exist a real polynomial Q such that P of P of X minus X equals P of X minus X all squared times Q of X for all real inputs X, okay? So this, they're the same as functions, as polynomials, okay? Now, there are a bunch of things that you might try to get sort of your head around this problem a little bit. You might try at first plugging in particular values of X, okay? I tried that to start off with. Didn't really get me too far. You might try things like take the derivative of the left-hand side and the right-hand side, see if that gets you anything. You can get a little bit of mileage out of that. But instead, what I'm going to start off with is I'm going to start off by, well, plugging in low-degree polynomials and matching up coefficients on the left and right hand side and try to figure out some solutions that way. Okay, and then maybe once I've got my head around it a little bit, I figured out some solutions, then maybe I can try to reason about what the set of all solutions looks like. Okay, so let's do that. Let's start off with low degree polynomials. Okay, and in particular, maybe let's just start off with linear polynomials and ask, okay, which linear polynomials, which polynomials of the form p of x equals ax plus b, which polynomials like that are solutions of this equation, or you know, which of them have the property that there exists a polynomial q that makes this equation here solvable. Okay, and I mean, to solve this question, let's just plug that polynomial in. Okay, so p, just everywhere you see p of x, replace it by ax plus b on both sides, and what you end up here is, you know, you get this equation here, a times ax plus b, because that's p, and then plus another b from the outside p minus x on the left-hand side, and then on the right-hand side, instead of p of x, you've just got an ax plus b, okay? Now what we're going to do is we're going to expand that out, and we're going to start asking questions about the different coefficients of powers of x on the left and right-hand side. And the first thing that I'm going to notice is that on the right-hand side there, there's an x squared, whereas on the left-hand side, there isn't. And on the right-hand side, okay, it's not quite an x squared, because it's x squared times q of x, right? But the point is, on that right-hand side there, no matter what polynomial q is, that, you know, x squared term, its degree can only increase. It's going to be x squared, maybe an x cubed, maybe an x to the power of 4, depending on the degree of q. But, you know, either way, what's going to have to happen is that term on the right is going to have to go away, because on the left-hand side, there are no x squareds, there are no x cubeds, and so on. Okay, so just by matching up coefficients, we can see right away that one of two things must happen. Okay, for that x squared term to get zeroed out and go away so that equality is even remotely possible here, either you have to have a minus 1 equals 0, that coefficient in front of x squared has to equal 0, or you have to have q of x equals zero, right? The polynomial outside of the square brackets has to equal zero. So one of those two things must happen, or both of them, okay? And let's just run through those two cases and see what happens, okay? In the first case, a minus one equals zero. In other words, a equals one. And if you just plug that in on the left-hand side of the equation, all you're left with is, well, the a squared minus one goes away. So you're left with a, b plus b, but a is one. So you've got two b on the left-hand side there. And if you do a similar thing on the right-hand side, all those a minus 1 and a minus 1 squareds everywhere go away. You're just left with b squared times q of x, okay? And this equation here, is there always a polynomial q that solves that equation? Yeah, there is. You can choose, you know, constant polynomials even, okay? If b is a non-zero thing, you can choose q to be the constant polynomial 2 over b. And if b equals 0, then pick q to be whatever you want, because that equation is just saying 0 equals 0 times q. So q can be whatever you want. So that over there... If a equals 1, then yeah, you've got a solution, okay? You can find a q that works. In the other case, if you've got q of x equals 0, the 0 polynomial, then what happens is, okay, everything on the right-hand side of this equation here is 0, so the stuff on the left-hand side must be 0 as well. In particular, that means that each of those two coefficients on the left-hand side must equal 0. So you've got to have a squared equals 1, so the coefficient of x is 0. And also, a, b plus b has to equal zero because that's the constant term in that polynomial. It's got to be the zero polynomial. Okay, and then you just solve this tiny little system of equations here. There are two possibilities for a squared equals one, right? a could be plus or minus one. If it's plus one, then the other equation tells me that I have to have b equals zero. If it's minus one, then the other equation tells me that b can be anything that I want, okay? So when you put all this together, what it tells you is that, okay, yeah, there are some linear polynomials for which this equation is solvable, for which there is a polynomial q, making this weird, ugly equation that we started with true. And, you know, those linear equations, they're just the ones that have coefficient a in front of the x, it's plus or minus one. 
and b can be whatever it wants to be, right? The constant term in the polynomial can be anything. So x plus b or negative x plus b. Yeah, it works for those linear polynomials and no others. Okay, that's not remotely a complete solution to this problem yet. We've only addressed linear polynomials, degree one polynomials. What about degree two, quart uh, quadratics? What about degree three, cubics? And so on. What about higher degree polynomials? This is where it gets trickier, okay? And you might try something like, okay, I'm going to plug in a degree two polynomial and can I solve it? Plug in a degree three polynomial and can I solve it? Again, just match up coefficients. And if you do this, that's absolutely a fine thing to do. But unfortunately, you're going to find that no, there, there are no solutions that are quadratic or cubic, or if you're really adventurous, even quartic. Okay, so now we start thinking, okay, I've got to rule things out in a more systematic approach. I've got to find a way of showing that no, lots of these other polynomials of higher degree, maybe all polynomials of higher degree are not solutions. There is no Q that works in those cases. Okay, so how do I do that? Okay, I've got to get more systematic with my approach here. And what I did was I noticed that this equation that I'm trying to solve here it kind of is screaming fixed points at me, right? Because we've got this p of x minus x here on the right-hand side. And if x is a fixed point of p, in other words, if p of x equals x, then that thing on the right-hand side there equals zero. And similarly, on the left-hand side here, I've got p of p of x. And if x were a fixed point, then that would sort of simplify down nicely, right? Like the inner p of x, that's just x, and then the p of that thing, that's still just x. Sort of the composition of the p of, with itself doesn't really cause me any headaches there. So something about this equation here is telling me that fixed points are relevant, but I'm not super comfortable with fixed points. I don't like them that much. I like roots of polynomials a lot better. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this p here and I'm just gonna shift it a little bit. I'm gonna define a new polynomial r, which is just p of x minus r, okay? And what this does is it turns any fixed points of P into roots of R, okay? And I'm going to rephrase this condition here that we're trying to satisfy. I'm going to rephrase it instead of in terms of P, in terms of R now. And I think this might be a little bit easier to work with just because I understand roots of polynomials a little bit better than I understand uh, fixed points of polynomials. I don't strictly know if this step was necessary. Maybe I'm just making things more complicated and you don't have to do this step. Or maybe it's even easier without it, but I found it convenient to do this, okay? So that's what I'm going to do replace p everywhere by r of x using this, uh, you know, relationship here. And when I do that, it boils down to the equation r of r of x plus x plus r of x equals r of x squared times q of x. I'm trying to find which polynomials are, for which polynomials are, there exists a q for which this equation here holds, okay? Okay, now the first thing that I notice when I look at this equation here is that r of r of x plus x, that, like, that's really ugly. I would like to understand it better. And one thing that I can sort of understand from this equation is that it must be a multiple of r of x itself, right? Because all the other terms in that equation have a factor of r of x, okay? So that r of r of x plus x must have a factor of r of x as well. It must be of the form some polynomial plus r of x. And I'd sort of like to understand a little bit better why that is or what I can do with that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down r of x explicitly in terms of it co its coefficients and try to see if I can sort of figure out why that funny little r of r of x plus x on the left there, why that's a multiple of r of x, like sort of where that's coming from and what can I do with that? Okay, so I'm going to do that, right? R of x equals the sum of coefficients aj times powers of x, x to the power j. Okay, and then when I plug that in on the left, what I get is, well, now the x that I'm plugging in is r of x plus x. Okay, so I've got that to the power j inside of the summation here. And that right there, that term that's raised to the power j, that's, you know, I can evaluate that via bi the binomial theorem, right? I mean, I'm just going to do another sum on the inside where that inner sum is running from zero up to whatever the exponent j is, you know, and I get these binomial coefficients and some power of the r of x and some power of x such that those exponents there add up to j. Okay, and now when I look at the summation here, you'll notice that every single term in the sum has an r of x to the power k. So, what that tells me is, yeah, this is a multiple of r, r of x, right? Because there's an r of x multiplying every single term in that sum, right? Except, except there's one exception to that, and that's when the exponent is zero, right? When k is zero, there's no r of x there because it gets raised to the power of zero. It's just a one, and it goes away. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, that k equals zero term, that's kind of weird, and that's throwing me off a little bit. I'm going to peel it off from the rest of the sum. 
Okay, so I'm going to take that sum that I've got, this double sum involving j and k, I'm going to copy down the exact same sum, except I'm going to peel the k equals zero terms off on their own into their own separate sum, separate from everything else. Okay, and now that double sum on the left, yeah, that really does have an r of x in every single term. So it really is a multiple of r of x. The second sum, this leftover piece, what is that? That's just r of x itself, right? Like the, the k equals zero term for all of those other j values, if I just add those up, that's exactly how I defined r of x in the first place. Okay, so what's happening here is I've got this weird double sum that's a multiple of r of x and then plus r of x, right? So the entire thing is a multiple of r of x. I can factor an r of x out of it and like the first double sum will be fine and then I get a plus one from this plus r of x over on the right hand side. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna plug it back into that equation that I called green star back in the day. In other words, like the equation that we're trying to solve, the sort of the equation involving r that is in the entire point of this. Okay, and when I do that, what I get is, well, okay, this hideous expression here, everything in the square brackets on the left, that's just the r of r of x plus x, okay? And now that, well, I'm gonna take this equation here and divide both sides by r of x, which I can do, because there's a factor of r of x in every single term here. And when I do that, it simplifies down just a little bit down to this form of the equation right here, okay? So I get this weird, ugly double sum where now the power of r of x is one smaller because I divided one copy of r of x out of everything. And now I just get a plus two on the left-hand side because I had a plus r of x and then plus another r of x, two r of x, but I divided by r of x as well. So I'm just left with a plus two. Now, this equation right here, I'd like to look at this equation and hopefully either get a contradiction out of it or at least learn something from it. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is in this equation here, I'm again gonna focus on, well, which terms have an r of x in them, right? Which terms are multiples of r of x and which terms are not, okay? So in that ugly double sum on the left, just like before, the multiples of r of x, well, those are all of the terms where the exponent on r of x is strictly bigger than zero. In other words, all of the terms where k is strictly bigger than one, yeah, those terms are multiples of r of x. And of course, the thing on the right-hand side, that's a multiple of r of x, that r of x times q of x, that's a multiple of r of x, okay? The other terms are not necessarily, okay? The other terms are, well, the terms that you get from k equals one, and then this rogue plus two over on the left-hand side, okay? Those things, I don't know what's happening with those. I'm gonna play a similar game to what I did earlier, okay? I'm gonna repeat what I did up above. I'm gonna peel off the k equals one terms from that double sum and separate them from all the rest of them. And when I do that, okay, if I focus on just what are the k equals one terms on that left-hand side there, well, I get the sum j equals zero up to n a j, just like before, the j choose k terms, well, I'm fixing k equals one here. So I just get j choose one, that's j. Okay, the r of x to the k minus one, well, k minus one is zero, so that goes away. And then x to the power of j minus k, k is one again, so that's x to the power of j minus one. Okay, so I get this funny little polynomial here, sum of aj times j times x to the j minus one. Okay, that's the k equals one component of that double sum on the left. And what is that? Well, if you squint really hard at that, you'll probably notice that that's exactly the derivative of the polynomial r that we started with, right? Okay, so what's going on here is on the left, on this sum, I've got a weird, ugly double sum where now k is starting from two because I peeled off the k equals one terms. And then I've got plus r prime plus two equals r of x times q of x. And now this equation I claim has something very, very wrong with it. And what does it have wrong with it is, well, okay, I'm gonna move every term that is a multiple of r of x over to the left-hand side. I'm gonna move every other term over to the right-hand side, okay? So on the left-hand side, I have that ugly double sum, and then I'm gonna have a minus r of x times q of x. So that's all on the left. On the right-hand side, I'm just gonna have minus r prime minus two, okay? The two terms that don't obviously have an r of x in them. Okay, and now that double sum on the left, remember, that double sum, it's some multiple of r of x, right? That right there is a polynomial times r of x. I'm going to call that polynomial s of x, right? This is some polynomial s of x times r of x. That's what that double sum is there. Okay, and then I subtract r of x times q of x. So on that left-hand side there, I've got r of x times 
s of x minus q of x, right? So r of x times a polynomial. If the degree of r is n, then that left-hand side has degree at least n, right? Because it's r times another polynomial. Whereas on the right-hand side, what's its degree? Well, on the right-hand side, I've got negative r prime minus 2. Well, if r has degree n, then r prime has degree n minus 1. That polynomial on the, on the right, it has smaller degree than the polynomial on the left. This doesn't make any sense, except in some very degenerate cases, right? There are a couple ways that this can make sense, but they're all very sort of specific. On the left, one way that this could make sense, for example, is if that polynomial s happens to equal the polynomial q. That's one way that they could uh, we could have something make sense here, because then, oh, you know, it's r of x, yeah, that's degree n, but times the zero polynomial. So the left-hand side just gets zeroed out entirely, and then you don't have this degree contradiction. So that's one thing that could happen. You could have q of x equals s of x. Okay, and then the only other thing that could happen is what if r was a constant polynomial? Because in that case, on the right-hand side, when I take the derivative of it, yeah, its degree goes down. Its, de its degree goes from one, degree of a constant polynomial, down to zero, the degree of the zero polynomial. But I'm also subtracting two from it, which it brings it back up to a constant polynomial. So its degree doesn't actually go down on the right-hand side then. Uh, if, if r is a constant polynomial. So that's another possibility. That's the only other possibility. That's the only other way this equation can possibly have a solution. Okay, now we just work through these two cases. Okay, in the first case that I described, when q of x equals s of x, what happens is, well, on the right-hand side, I have negative r prime minus 2 equals 0. So r prime equals negative 2. Oh, so r of x is a linear polynomial with slope negative 2. And then I just convert that back. Remember, like I didn't actually want to solve the original equation in terms of this polynomial r. The original question that Putnam asked me was in terms of this polynomial p, right? And p of x is r of x plus x. So I've got to add x to this. Okay, so when I do that, I get p of x equals negative x plus b, which, I mean, I already knew that that was a solution. Now I'm showing that that's not just a solution, but actually it's one of only two possibilities. And then the other possibility just comes from considering, okay, what if r of x is a constant? Okay, well, if r of x is a constant, let's just call it b. That's a constant. And then just like before, p of x is x plus r of x. So it's x plus b. And that, again, we already showed that that was a solution back when we considered linear polynomials right at the start of this video. But now we've shown that's the only other possibility regardless of degree. And then we're done. Okay, that's the entire proof. We've shown that these two cases they were, we already knew about, they're actually the only two cases. They're the only possibilities here. So yeah, the only po uh, polynomials P that satisfy the given condition, right? The only polynomials for which there exists a polynomial Q satisfying yada, 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 yada ugly uh, polynomial equation. There, P of X equals X plus B and P of X equals negative X plus B. And that's it. All right, so thanks for watching, everyone. That's all I got for you today. We'll do another one of these in a couple more days. See you around.